Hey everybody, welcome back to Gun Totem Minnesotan. Today I'm going to do kind of a first look at the Zerotech Optics 5 to 30 Trace Advanced. It's a first focal plane with a 34 millimeter tube, exposed turrets, side parallax, side button illumination, and it comes with those Tenebrax caps that you see on top. Lots of features, very, very cool. It's sitting right now on my CZ457. This configuration that you see right here is going to change very soon. Actually, about the time of my making this video, I'm going to be throwing on some match components, uh, better barrels and other components on there. But at the time when I received it, I was just using this right here. And it's actually a pretty nice setup. Was able to make some hits out to 530 yards with it so far, but lots more content to come. Here's just a first look. All right, let's start off with an overview of some of the features. This is gonna have Tenebrex caps. These are some of the best caps you can get for precision rifle scope. They're extremely rugged, yet they have a softness to them. They work really well in the cold here in Minnesota. I need Tenebrex caps and need something that can withstand cold weather and they lay down pretty nice and flat and don't get in the way of whatever I have going on over here. If I have a red dot up here, I can turn them. They're adjustable so they will move and kind of click out of the way which is really nice and they actually are just a clip on. They work particularly well with this because it has a lockable adjustable diopter. Now, if you've never had uh, an adjustable diopter, I don't know what kind of optics you're running, but if you've never had an adjustable diopter, that just means you can change the reticle sharpness. And so roughly speaking, you're gonna look at a blue sky or a blank wall and you're gonna move this dial back and forth until the reticle is sharp for your eye. Just taking quick peeks at a time, you're not gonna stare at it because otherwise your eye will memorize the image, it'll improve the image because that's what your eyes can do. They can continually try to focus in on something. So you just take a peek at it and move it back and forth. But this one is a locking diopter. The reason that that's important is because this dial right here will lock the setting and so that it's not gonna get bumped. And if you move those Tenebrex caps around, these right here, if you move these caps around and it's not locked, if it was on a non-locking, it may move your actual diopter setting and change your sharpness. Or if let's say maybe you give it to your buddy and he messes with stuff when it's not locked, he moves something around, maybe he doesn't know how to use an optic and he moves your setting so it's not quite as sharp. The nice thing about this is you have these two pieces so I can actually move sharpness and that's gonna be the first dial that you're seeing here. This first piece is the actual diopter, and the second ring is the lock for it itself. And they're very smooth, but they have a firmness to them, which you would expect, you would want a little bit of firmness. If it's too sloppy, you've got loose tolerances or there's something uh, you know, shaky in there, that's really bad to have in a diopter. You want it to be um, firm in the sense that it takes some effort to move it where you wanna navigate it, and then it locks down. So locking diopter for the win, absolutely love it. And I think this is the way that probably all precision rifle scopes need to go. Taking a look at the magnification ring, your power is from five all the way up to 30 power. There is a cattail or magnification lever assist, and there's more than one setting. I've got this one capped off right here, so you can roughly be attached to right around the eight power or around 19 power. Those are the locations, and I just prefer this one. This is the most practical for the way that I run optics, but might be different for you, depending on if you think you're gonna run into a bolt knob, that could be a thing for some people. My bolt knob is um, angled and has a reduced throw, so it doesn't really run into it for me, even if I were to run it on this eight power, nine power setting somewhere in here, it wouldn't be an issue. The magnification ring itself is incredibly smooth, it's fluid, there's no grit whatsoever. Easy to go from five to 30, I could do it quickly if I want to because of this. I don't need the cattail to move it because it's extremely fluid. Very comfortable, feels about, you know, about right for the price point. This is a premium level optic, guys. There's no way around it. This is top tier stuff and that's a top tier magnification lever for sure. See, there's a nice uniform uh, feel and milling. You're gonna see this as well on the turrets, something very similar there. 
and whether my hands are wet or cold, I'm not gonna have issues with this. I will test it out in the winter and give some feedback. Sometimes in the winter things sludge up a little bit, but I suspect this is still gonna operate just fine even in the winter. Usually the ones that are very tight or firm or choppy, those just get worse in the winter, but the ones that are already smooth tend to flow well in the winter time and I have no reason to think this one will not perform well. As far as values, it goes 5, 6, 8, 10, 15, 20, 25, and 30. The reason this makes a lot of sense, it's most likely that you're either going to use it on 5 or 6 power, 8 or 10 power, 15 power, 20, 25, or 30. And I think this right here shows that they are genuinely consulting people who are into PRS, precision rifle matches, people who actually shoot long range. This is exactly exactly how I would set up an optic for your numerical indicators and the range of magnification that makes sense. I'm telling you, this is exactly how I would set it up. I don't need an individual tick for every single number. And typically I'm looking for these values right here. So they stand out nicely. They're easy to see. And I don't have any sludgy, you know, start stop. It doesn't get stuck like I see on some of the cheaper medication, uh, Chinese made optics actually. Nope, goes all the way and releases perfectly well. No slop in the tolerances, meets up really well. I, I kind of grab these sometimes and move them around to see if there's any slop and this one has zero. Most of the time, I think the reticle works really well for me, if I'm gonna use extended range, I can go eight, nine power, somewhere in here. If I'm in a competition and I'm shooting true long range, probably 15 power. If I'm shooting NRL 22, maybe 10 power. NRL 22, it, 10 power just seems to get by most of the time. I'm only shooting out to a couple hundred yards at the most, maybe a little past a couple hundred yards. And then with actual precision rifle, I might wanna spot at 20 power if I'm trying to tell if a target is gray or it's just a bush or something, maybe I'll go up to 20. Most of the time, 15 power gives me excellent field of view, a really nice shot of the reticle, and I can see a nice bright image. I like about 15 power, and I still feel confident for those follow-up shots because I can spot my trace and see quite a bit of the field before me. I've noticed that a few people who have reviewed this optic before I got my hands on it said the same thing, they found the same thing. These turrets, not just aesthetically, but actual functionality, are some of the best turrets I have felt. Absolutely love them. It's a nice, hard, crisp zero stop. Each individual tenth lines up exactly, exactly on the witness line located underneath. And you're gonna have those half mil indicators at every revolution here. This optic has plenty of internal elevation. On this 50 MOA rail, I've got 10, 20, I should have 27.5, let's see, 27, yeah, about 27.5. 27.5 mils, that'll get you way out there. And those clicks just feel so precise. It's milled so extremely well, or machined so well, I should say. It's clicky, I can hear it, I can feel it. If I had gloves on in the winter, which I'll try that out, I'm absolutely gonna be able to feel that, but I can hear it too. Extremely high quality feel. Really good scalloping done on the turrets here. It grabs my fingers when I'm indexing and the numbers are big enough that when I'm behind the rifle, I'm not gonna have issue seeing or reading these. And also the turret is not so tall like certain brands where it actually covers up <laughs> some of the field downrange. It's just done so tastefully. And I think these are probably some of the best designed aesthetically looking turrets on any Zero Tech to date. I think it's probably the best actually. 10 mils per revolution, which is the way I like it. Our minds, you know, even as Americans, our minds think in tens, and it just makes a lot of sense to put 10 mils per revolution on there. Not concerned about a second revolution indicator. I don't need that. Uh, I can pay attention plenty well to those kinds of things. And once you start getting beyond um, that first revolution, you know, you're shooting really far and I think you're, you're probably not really gonna need a revolution indicator. If you were worried, you can always go back to your zero and work up from there, which I've seen people with revolution indicators still do. And so I don't need that extra feature. I actually prefer it this way.
When it comes time to reset your zero stop and your turrets, all you need to do is loosen these three Allens on top. This is machined extremely well, fits very, very well against this O-ring right here. It's gonna keep it uh, basically you know, water resistant. Then you're gonna see this orange disc on top, which also has Allens inset here that are going to tension against your center turret. And those need to be loosened. And then all you have to do is rotate this clockwise until it stops. Then re-tighten those same Allens. And you don't have to go crazy hard. Don't go Hulk strength on them. It's not necessary. And then I'm gonna get my cover, my turret cover here, and line up that zero exactly. And I'm gonna go tighten those three turret um, Allens. And that's it. When it comes to your windage, this is a capped windage, but it does have a witness mark that you can see there and also directional aerials for up and then right is down and the numbers themselves are going to have half mil indicators which rise above and the numerical indicators are listed right or left underneath to reset this there's no zero stop you just need to loosen those allens one more time bring it back to zero and tighten them up same way same process uh, one point i like the engineering on this these actually sit inside rather than over and so when you thread it back in here if i can do it left-handed i thread it back in here meets up really nice good tight tolerances on everything on this optic i can't stress that enough they did a lot of really good engineering with this and i'm a really big fan especially of capped windage as i previously mentioned uh i just like the way it's machined the way that this actually threads into this housing here and i could take it off these are not going to move on their own. I don't think it's terribly easy to move them. Same scalloping you're going to see here. And it does have indicators for right or left. I actually kind of prefer leaving it capped. I don't dial windage very often. But if you do, you just take that off and you'll be fine. Now on to the parallax, which is your inner wheel here. And out here, this button is your illumination. I'll get to that in a second. You're going to notice that the parallax has a minimum focus distance of 20 meters. That's perfect. It's going to be great for NRL 22. It's going to be great for varmint hunting, which I'm going to use very soon. And I can always throw the magnification down a little bit, 8 to 10 power, if I'm going to go closer and it's going to reduce any parallax error, perceived parallax. It's going to knock that down. If I need to take a 10 yard shot, I'll just move it down to 6 power, even 5 power. And I'm not going to have dramatic parallax issues. I'll still hit my squirrel or gopher or whatever it is. But once I get out to 30, 40 yards here, I feel a little more comfortable going up to 8 and 10 power for sure. Very smooth. The effort I'm putting into it is not much. It's not bad, but it's perfectly smooth. It's not stiff at all. That would not be the word for this. I would just say it takes effort to move it and it's the appropriate effort. Remember in precision rifle scopes, higher quality optics, if it's too firm, that's a bad sign. If it's too soft or too easy to move, it's sloppy, that's also a bad sign. I've actually had a rifle scope from another manufacturer that moved too easily, and when it would recoil, it would change my parallax setting. And I thought something was broken in the scope, but it was actually just my parallax moving on this other brand every time I recoiled with a heavy recoiling rifle. And that was really disturbing to me that it could happen. Um, and apparently it was a part of their design flaw in that particular optic. This is not going to move on you. It's gonna be right where you leave it and it's easy to navigate. I'm not gonna have issues with that in the winter time when it's cold. You can see the numerical values go up. Something really kind of cool is they have 500, 700, 1000, 2000 and infinity and i plan on putting all those numbers up to 2000 perhaps slightly past 2000 i plan to put those to test hopefully this next year 2025 i would like to do some elr competitions or at least elr uh, range practice and i'm going to try out that 2000 and see how much of a difference does it make i've actually got 2000 yards that i can use somewhere and at least optically see what it looks like use my laser range finder and just see what clarity looks like. I'll probably get to that in the next month or so. This is the illumination button. Now I'm gonna let you know, I'm gonna have a separate breakout video just talking about the illumination on this, but it is one feature I like. It's very tactile and clicky. I can both hear it and feel it. And when I'm looking through the optic, it is a functional button. 
I think it's probably a little bit easier in some ways rather than the additional post on some designs where you have your illumination, then you have your parallax, or you have your parallax rather, and then your illumination sticking out from there. Sometimes the two uh, interfere with each other in some ways. Sometimes if you have a sticky illumination, it moves your parallax feature. So yeah, I could actually see the button being a superior way to go. Like I said, I'll have a breakout video just about that. And lastly, there's a look at that Tenebrex cap on the front. Very tactile, lays down flat when I need it to. And for competitions, I really want this excellent quality glass to be protected because my bipod over here sometimes has sand on it. Well, every time it has sand on it, has dirt, has snow. And when I tip my rifle you know, barrel up between stages, that stuff falls down and I need good quality caps. I've shot in snowstorms, I've shot in rain, and I just want the ability to protect my lenses, especially when you get to this level quality of glass, guys, it makes sense to have something like this. And I really wouldn't do an optic like this without some sort of high quality cap. Tenebrex made in Canada, pretty cool. Like those big 56 millimeter objective and the body is done really well with the way that it lays out. Just the aesthetic in general is the best in my opinion. All right, real briefly, what you're looking at here is a BCA Bear Creek Arsenal 201 sitting inside of a KID chassis, KID trigger, Fab Defense Stock Atlas bipod right here with the Zero Tech 4 to 24 trace advance. This one also is wearing a red dot from Zero Tech. I have a lot of videos on the Zero Tech red dots. I really like them and I love to run them piggyback. My only problem with them is I don't have enough. That is truly my problem. I need more because I want to put another one on here. Love them running it on a pistol that I have right now on my side. The 4 to 24, I've got a lot of videos on and it's really cool. This happens to be a 30 millimeter. We'll talk more about differences in a second. This is a CZ 457, very factory in most ways other than the, the trigger and maybe a, a couple things on the end here. But the barrel itself is something I'll trade out. Jarvis is sending out some barrels to the channel and they're going to be premium. I'm very confident they are going to be one of the best options for a CZ 457. But right now I'm running it with the factory one. Atlas bipod. This uh, this is a super cal. This is the regular Atlas. Fab Defense. Thank you to Fab Defense for sending stuff out to the channel as well. This is their um, carbine stock, and this one is their fixed stock. So there's some similarities here between these two builds. I do have an Anarchy Outdoors grip on here. I highly suggest Anarchy Outdoors, and they are a channel sponsor. They've sent things out a few times now, and I'm really happy with everything Anarchy does. I love this grip. This happens to be the tuxedo grip right here. I'm running an MDT grip on the other one, but I'm starting to run more and more of the Anarchy stuff because I like those grips. I like the angle and the colorations. Moving on, I have an Area 419 rail under here. This is a 50 MOA rail. And I have on top, of course, the Zero Tech Trace Advanced 5 to 30. This is their newest version. This is a 34 millimeter optic. So let's talk about some of the differences between the two. First of all, the Trace Advanced 4 to 24, it's gonna be lighter, it's a 30 millimeter, it has a 50 millimeter objective, still an excellent optic. This one happens to have a, a Tremor 3 reticle in it. I love the Tremor 3, I like the size of the center dot, I like the way the Stadia lays out, it's got 40 mils of holdover. Gotta be honest with you, I'm usually done at 20 or 25. That's usually as far as I need to, but I don't have a 20 MOA or even a 15 MOA base on here. I have a zero MOA. And so I've got 10 mils in, in the uh, revolution here from the way that I zeroed it. So with a 22, 10 mils, it'll get me past 200 yards, which is what most of the competitions here are with NRL 22 or 22 competitions, precision 22. It'll get me that far. But I do have to start using holdover. And if I want to shoot at 630 yards, which I like to do for fun, just some ELR, 22 shooting, I have to use the reticle extended. So I think I need about 42 mils, 41 mils, depending on the temperature and the ammo. So I end up holding a lot, a lot of elevation, and I'm way down there on magnification, usually around six or seven power, depending on the configuration and the ammo. But this optic will get it done. It has a minimum parallax setting, if I can move it down, of 20 meters. And as it goes up, you're going to get to uh, some of your bigger numbers goes 200, 300, 500, 1,000, infinity. Internally, it's advertised with a certain amount of internal elevation. I will be honest with you. I found that mine had roughly 29. 
It's a little more than what's advertised, and I was really excited to see that. And one of the most impressive things is when I find extra elevation hiding in a turret from any company, usually that extra elevation, the degradation of the image, especially in a 50 millimeter, uh, it's just a little too much, and I tend not to use the extra. And so I'll use the advertised range because reliability in some optics is not there. The image quality just starts to get really poor. And um, this one is not that way. I'm so pleased with it. It's an excellent image, really crisp image. And that Tremor 3 is uh, a good matchup for that. I don't always shoot a Tremor 3 though. And that's where this one comes in. So I'm gonna put this one to the side. Now I'm gonna nerd out for a second. I don't think I've been more excited for an optic release ever. I love the aesthetics of the 5 to 30. I love everything about it. I love the stats that it comes with. I love the configuration, the way that the adjustments are set up, the capped windage, the features. I just love everything about this optic. This one is my favorite, even over the 4 to 24. Although the 4 to 24 is very versatile and it can do a lot of things. It can be a hunting optic for me. It can be a competition optic for me. It can be an ELR optic for me. It's a very good optic. And configured with a Tremor 3, I think it's probably it's probably going to cover everything that I do in shooting. But this, I feel like, is better. And here's where I'm coming from. This optic, it's a 34mm tube, allows for a little more internal elevation, and it certainly has it in this optic. It has a 50mm objective. I think it's slightly brighter than the 4-24. to And it should be. That makes sense, especially if it's configured right and it's built uh, correctly. I think this is a little brighter. I just did some testing back and forth. I've got about an hour before sundown. It is a little cloudy out, uh, which actually makes for a nice image. So as I'm testing here at a little past 100 meters, a little past 200 meters on this range, and then I was just testing at 600 meters over on the other range, I found this just seems like it's got a better field of view. That's That makes sense. And then it also has a brighter image. I think that makes, you know, sense with any 56 millimeter if you're going to go up to 56 it has to bring better light collection and uh, i'm hoping with a a longer optic and the way that it's configured long story short i'm hoping for a better field of view and this one does provide a better field of view so that's great the 4 to 24 isn't bad this one's improved i'll say that the 4 to 24 eye box it feels a little bit more touchy to me than this does on low power so if I go with both of them down to around that 5-6 power, I feel like actually the Trace Advanced 5-30 to is a little superior in the eye box. When we go up to, obviously that one only goes to 24 power. When I go up to 25 power, I'm still really pretty comfortable. Uh, 30 power, it's going to get more touchy, and that's very normal. You have to think about it. You're not running around at 30 power doing you know tactical games or whatever you're, you're going to be down lower because you need the field of view you need brightness if you're shooting later in the evening you need a, just a brighter image and uh, the degradation of the image if you're going to dial all the elevation out of here which this one is advertised with a max of around 34 ish right around there if you're going to put all those things together it's just a little much i like 30 for spotting uh maybe spotting for a friend identifying a target if i'm on a field where all the targets are gray They've been beat up all day, and I might want to push it up just for a second to see where is that target and distinguish which one is the right one. That's something that would make a lot of sense. Or if I'm shooting 22, and I've got this thing weighted down, and I'm shooting for groups at 50 and 100 yards, I don't mind pushing it up closer to that 30 range. But just for me, I'm not the kind of shooter who typically is going to spend a lot of time at that magnification, especially doing gun game stuff. All that to say, I like having the option. I like that it's there, and I do find myself actually utilizing it, just not every time and not in every shooting situation, especially not during a competition. Mm, probably not in ELR ever. I probably wouldn't use that much. 25 is really like, that's great. If it's not hot out, I can get there. If it's a little warm, closer to 18 to 20 power, maybe 15 power even. I've already touched on it that I really appreciate the parallax, the side parallax here, which has illumination. I'll have a breakout video, separate video about that. This has a 500, it goes from 300, 500, 700, 1000, 2000, and up to infinity. And I find that there is actually a function for that. I can tell some difference as I'm going back and forth. I just tested it a little while ago at extreme distance because I needed beyond that um, 1000 yards to see if it actually makes a little bit of a difference. And it's small. I'm going to be honest with you, it's very, very hard to discern. 
But after looking at it, bobbing my head around, looking at the reticle, looking at the image, the target itself, I actually do think it makes a difference. And so I'm going to say I appreciate having the 2,000 yards on there. That being said, I don't need any numbers. The way that I usually do it is by just moving it back and forth, moving my head around and making sure it's curing parallax. It's nice to have numbers on there as a reference. I don't have to have them. But this is good. As a parallax feature goes, it's my favorite. It's awesome. The turrets. I need to go back to the turrets for a second. Like I said, it has something like 34-ish mils available, but if you use the zero stop, it's going to knock it down closer to something like 30 mils of internal travel. I have maxed this out completely. I used all the elevation initially on a different rifle, and in my opinion, when I use all of that elevation, I max it out. I'm at the extreme ends of range. I mean, within a tenth or two of the extreme ends of range, and I've got it bumped up on medication, I think it's going to be a little distorted. That shouldn't disappoint you. And if you don't know anything about optics, maybe you think that I'm saying that there's a problem. It's not. This is falling in line with other premium level optics that have around the similar elevation uh, available in a 34 millimeter tube with this quality of glass. It's pretty common. You're going to find that when you max everything out and you go real high on the magnification, um, in fact, I kind of don't want to do that on a hard recoiling rifle. I think it might be a little sensitive. All scopes might be a little sensitive in that way. And the image just isn't that good. I'm looking for the best image I can. And this optic has a 20 mil holdover reticle. That's about as far as I probably need to go. This has the RMG2. It is definitely an increase and an upgrade over the RMG1. I'm I'm a fan of the RMG1. I've run it on multiple rifles now. I've shown it on my channel with the original Trace Advanced, which I reviewed in a winter storm years ago, I think. This one, though, with the RMG2, I really like it on rimfire. I'm going to like it on center fire, and I'm going to like it at ELR distances because I can back down to that 15, 10 power. I don't need to run everything to the extreme ends of range and max it out. I can functionally use that reticle because the bottom of the glass on this is pretty darn clear. And at 20 mils, I'm not stretching it out. I'm not going to an extreme. When you go to 40 mils, like on the Tremor 3, you really need a very, very good image. You really do. You need excellent glass. And some optics, uh, I'm not going to say, but there's another big box brand optic that likes to use the Tremor 3. And they have just inferior glass, especially to the Zero Tech that I'm looking at right now. They have inferior glass. And I've noticed every time I look at a Tremor 3 in that inferior glass towards the bottom of the reticle, it's just basically unusable. I don't think it looks good. I'm not impressed with that particular other optic. I'm able to use this 4-24 Tremor 3, but I think this makes a lot of sense, especially for people who are going to be a hobbyist and maybe you want to do some PRS, you want to do some ELR. This has enough internal elevation to get all of your serious calibers out there and even something like a 6.5 Creedmoor. If you just want to take a 6.5 Creedmoor to a mile, this has enough. Get yourself a good rail, you're good to go. And even if you're shooting uh, slower bullets, you want to take a 308 out there for whatever reason and do that. It also has probably enough elevation. The way it's set up right now with a 50 MOA rail, I have 27 and a half mills. I'm going to just double check. 27 and a half. Yeah, that's extreme. I would probably stop at 27 myself. So on a 50 MOA rail, absolutely, you're going to have enough. It's going to be right there. And if you don't want to dial out or you want to put it on a 30 MOA rail, you can still hold over. And as long as you're shooting in dryish conditions, you're not shooting against vegetation, you'll probably see your hits and misses pretty well. And in my experience, uh, shooting past a mile with other optics, I actually don't really need beyond... I would say 20 power ever. I could see really well, even on 15, 18 power, somewhere in there. And just for fun, I've bumped it up to higher magnifications. And this optic is going to be no different. When I take this to a mile, I think it's going to have to be in 2025. I take this to a mile. I'm going to actually going to try to push it beyond a mile and go to two miles with this. And probably on my 300 PRC, it's just the most capable, but possibly on my 6.5 and my 308, just because I, I, I really like this optic and I trust it. On both the Trace Advanced optics that I have, the tracking, I don't discern error. I, I don't have any functional difference between my data with both of these. It lines up exactly where it's supposed to. They are extremely crispy in a good way. They're audible. They line up exactly on the witness line. Both the turrets on these are very good. One thing I like about the 5-30 a little better than the 4-24, for competition especially, it's just bigger. 
And as it gets colder out, we're going to be in fall here and you get into the 30s um, in the fall. It's just nice to have a bigger turret to grab onto, especially if you're going to wear gloves. It's easier. Um, it feels different. The spacing between these two, the turrets on the 5 to 30 and the 4 to 24, it feels a little different. Both are good. Both are winners. Both are very positive and trustworthy. But I'm going to say the 5 to 30 is just that next level. It seems like an improvement to me. And they're not so much thuddy. They're more of a clicky turret. And I can do the thuddy kind of turrets or the clicky turrets as long as the actual click is not mushy and there's not terrible backlash. This, I can't even, I can't even manufacture backlash. I can't make it look like it. It's just either going to click or it's not. I would say reasonable effort to move it, but it's intentional. I don't think this is just going to move on its own, like right now. It's not moving on its own. I don't think it's going to get dialed in a bag. The windage certainly isn't because it's a capped windage, which I like. But as far as I can tell, I think it's going to take actual intentional force. I don't need a uh, lift to operate turret. That's not important to me. And when, when I'm shooting competitions, this is probably a preference. But when it comes to shooting competitions, I don't really like lift to operate. I just want to dial it and dial it and dial it where I need to and go back to zero. I have to have a zero stop for competition optics, but other than that, I really don't need the lift to operate. I don't need a revolution indicator. Sometimes I just don't like those. I think they get in the way and they can limit elevation. This optic has been designed and configured in a way that is perfect for my particular preferences. And I think most of you out there would get a lot out of this. I do think the optic is good. I think it's competitive. I like the image. I, as I already said, I'm probably not going to be shooting this above 25 power very much. I think the image is optimized right around 25 at max. For me, probably more like 15 power most of the time, or maybe 20 power. And I'm on a 50 MOA rail. When I shoot competitions with this and I'm dialing, you know, a mil, two mils, that's probably the most that an average comp has. Some of the bonus stages, I might need seven, seven and a half mils. Um, and if you shoot to 300, you know, then I'm up to 15, five and the image is all really good in there. If I go beyond the 27 mils and I'm maxing that out and then I max out magnification, like I said, I think it's a little much. And so I just want to make sure that your expectations are accurate to what any scope can do. And I'm talking the four and $5,000 optics too. When I see them maxed out in elevation and maxed out in magnification, I start seeing degradation of the image. Those four and five thousand dollar optics, believe it or not, they will darken quite a bit. Some of them, and the image might just be a little distorted. It's not as clear. It might get milky. I can think of one particular optic that's around four thousand five hundred dollars. And you know what? If I dial it max magnification and I move it, or I dial it to max elevation rather, and I move it to max magnification, the image is unusable. Unusable, absolutely. So this being closer to the I think on the market, you'll see it around 2,800, maybe a little cheaper than that even. This, you shouldn't expect that this can perform better than a $5,000 optic. If you run all the way to the max and all the way to the max, the image is a little distorted and I've used it and I was successful in using it. I just start to notice right around that 30 power that, yeah, it's not quite as good and it's going to reduce a little bit of the image. You'll, you'll see a little egg um, in there it just kind of looks less than optimum. It's such a good scope. I don't know why you would even do that. I just want to throw that out there for newbies or somebody who buys this and doesn't know anything about it. I would say run it at reasonable amounts of magnification, right around that 25 power max, and then as much elevation as you want or do it the way I do. And I get pretty close to the end of range of travel. And then I start using holdovers with that RMG2, which I'm a big fan of and is a huge improvement. If you're on a budget and you want to do long range and ELR and PRS, I'm going to recommend the RMG2 because it's a little cheaper. They don't have to pay for the rights for that Tremor 3 reticle. And so this one's a little cheaper, but you still get 20 mils of holdover. I think that's sufficient for everyone out there. I, I can't think of why you would have to have 40 mils most of the time. Uh, I am the guy who runs the Tremor 3 in the 4 to 24 and in that one. Yeah, I use the full 40 mils sometimes, but even then I don't prefer to. I would rather dial some and then hold a little if I have to. And this is just so much cheaper than the Tremor 3. So I can get behind it. It's really good. If you're just sold out for Tremor 3, 
then save a couple hundred extra dollars and go for that one. But this optic gets the green light. It's good to go. Love it on a rimfire. This is just a first look video. It is not my official review, although I'm going to be honest with you, I already love it. It is probably my favorite optic and it's going to continue to be a favorite optic, but I have more to come with this center fire new barrels for rim fire i'm going to just keep trying it and using it and actually have a competition at the end of this month hopefully i record some of that get some footage if you have any questions about the 5 to 30 zero tech products in general go ahead and reach out or you can comment down below and i'll try to answer those and tell me what you want to know about this optic how you want to see them compared or used in the future or maybe compared against other optics you've seen on my channel i'm more than happy to do that and lastly thank you to zero tech for sending this out i feel absolutely privileged to get it and especially happy that this is not a dud because it's a big deal it is a premium optic at a premium price and it successfully has met my expectations, so I think it's going to meet everyone else's too. All right, this time I will try to uh, actually all the way back down, and I will hold I will hold 20 in that reticle. I want to try out that new RMG2. I think on 8 power, oh yeah. Yep, on 8 power, I can still get down there. That's the extreme ends of the reticle. Let's see what happens. <laughs> First round impact. That's with 20 mils of holdover. And the glass is clear enough at the bottom of the reticle. It does not distort it um, hardly at all. I would say a tiny bit but hardly anything, so much so that I can trust the stadia down there. A little tall. A little tall. Man, that's awesome. I really like that reticle. Very reliable, very bright image, actually. Pretty surprised how well it does. I mean, on low power, I'm, I'm probably not surprised, but on higher power, I'm still getting a really bright image. And that one is fast. That bullet was fast. Let's... Um... go back to 27 I'm gonna hold five again go up to 25 power and just finesse that parallax a little bit that's about there a little low I can spot all those misses by the way easy Bad bullet. 